Coming up next on Tech News Today, MacBook Pro isn't recommendable, according to Consumer Reports this time. Also, U.S. government wants foreign travelers to cough up their social media accounts upon entry. Nintendo has big plans for mobile, and Ron Richards and I check in on some tech trends from the year and decide if they're here to stay. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1668, recorded Friday, December 23rd, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about all the biggest tech, tech news stories when they exist. Today, it's a little dry. I ain't gonna lie. Uh, with people who are passionate about technology. I'm Jason Howell, of course, Megan Maroney out again today. She started her Christmas break early, and I applaud her for that. It's a very good idea. I'm going to put it in my notebook, and she's going to be here next year, and we'll see how she likes it. Joining me today is Ron Richards. How's it going, Ron? Happy holidays. Hey. Merry Christmas. Excellent. I'm, What's I'm going here on? At the nor I'm here at the North Pole. I've been wrapping presents for Santa. We're getting ready for the holidays. It's a lot of work, let me tell you. So, <laughs> I know it's a lot of work. Yeah. I feel I completely understand. I was building a dollhouse a few minutes ago. So I, and then it's a noble effort, my friend. And I'm, a wise move. I'm sorry that I said that out loud because every once in a while my daughter when she's on YouTube catches me on this on this network because you know, because the the show is subscribed on the YouTube account. And so I hope she didn't make it this far into the show. You might need to unsubscribe that quickly before Christmas. <laughs> That's true. I have control. I have the power. Hang on, hang on. Okay, Google, unsubscribe Jason from his own show. Uh, okay, cool. There you go. Good. Okay, you just unsubscribe <laughs> a lot of people from the show, maybe, <laughs> potentially. Hey, um, before we kind of get into the tech news, you posted something on Instagram. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so uh, I was just, you heard me set yelling, okay, Google, I own a Google Home on uh, often on All About Android on Tuesdays at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. We talk about Google Home and how much I love it. It's my favorite device of the year so far. And last night I had a Christmas party and we had Christmas music playing and I noticed Google Home had a little Easter egg when I told it what Christmas music to play. So I shot a quick video this morning um, and I could show you, let's play, hit play and we with can see audio, what happened. With audio? With audio, with audio. Okay, here we go. We're gonna play it with audio right now. I heard it very faintly. All right, play your Google Play Music playlist. Is that all the way? Yeah. Well, anyway, so the yeah. audio is fine, but it's more the video. You see what just happened? Yeah, I, told I it, see. I told Google, play my Christmas playlist, and the little dots turned to red and green and made a little Christmas wreath while it started to play the playlist, which is oh. an Easter egg I had not known about. Um, which I thought was super cool. So there you go. So that is really cool. Isn't that neat? I love the little surprises like that. Where like we were at the party and and, and uh, my girlfriend was like, "Did that just make a wreath with the lights?" I was like, "I think it did." And so we did it again, and sure enough, it did. So, uh, so yeah. So if you say, "Okay, Google, please play Christmas music or play a Christmas playlist," it will make the lights do a little Christmas wreath for you. Oh, so there you go. we need more yeah. of that. I don't know how you yeah. do more of that with just those little dots, but they can do lots of colors. I'm sure there are other opportunities. Clever. Very clever. So mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah, very so. neat. I'll have to take a look at that because <laughs> I know I will be using the Google Home to be playing Christmas music over the next couple of nice. days. So. Very good. Uh, all right. Let's talk about some tech news stories here. First things first, there is a first time for everything. Today's first time comes courtesy of Consumer Reports, who, for the first time in its history of rating and reviewing Apple's MacBook Pros, will not recommend the new batch based on poor battery performance and reliability. After testing all three models, Consumer Reports determined that battery results were too incons inconsistent uh, between trials, ranging widely, they say, from 18.5 hours down to 8 hours on a 15-inch model, just as one example, and numerous tests, repeated efforts, and every time it was just like they were getting very inconsistent results, so it made it impossible for them to uh, wholeheartedly uh, recommend the new MacBook Pros. What do you think, Ron? 
I mean, I, I was startled to see this, um, but also I felt I had to wonder if they were testing brand new MacBooks or MacBooks that have been used after a month because I feel like every MacBook I've ever owned for the past 10 years got this kind of inconsistent battery life after about a month of use. So maybe this is more realistic than we think. <laughs> so so you're talking about like it's yeah. almost like you have to break it in a little bit, see, get get the battery seasoned a little well, bit, dash I, it with a little feel, salt and pepper. and Yeah, a little bit, but I almost, I almost feel like this is the reality of what MacBook batteries have been like for ages and this is that, that, that someone's finally saying it you know like okay. how many times i can't tell you how many times i watched the battery life on my on my macbook pro go from 100 percent to 33 percent over what feels like two or three hours you know so i think the battery life is is a real issue and the fact that they're calling it out this early is startling and and they they mentioned that they shared the results with apple um, right. To hopefully find a fixer of diagnostics, but like Consumer Reports isn't screwing around. They they have no skin in the game other than protecting consumers. So if these are the results they got, these are the results I believe, and I would I'm glad I didn't pull the trigger early. Well, uh, so uh, my wife uh, got one of these, and she's been using it, and she's loving it. I asked her actually after reading this, I was like, so how has your battery performance been? I didn't lead her in any direction. I just said, would you say do you, do you are you happy with the performance you're getting battery wise, or are you not? And she said she's been very very thrilled with it. Of course, the laptop she had before at hand was a MacBook Air that was probably from like I don't know 2000. It was really old, uh, 2010, 2011, somewhere around there. So. Anything would have been an improvement, so maybe that's the case there. But Consumer Reports says the normal fluctuation sits somewhere around 5%, if not less than that, and this was way out of that. Yeah, I mean, th th these are startling results, and and I, I mean, a lot of people depend on consumer uh, consumer reports. I mean, consumer reports might, to you and me might seem like a older brand, or does it you know does it really matter? But like, I know a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm not buying that. I got a better review in Consumer Reports. Right. So. Yeah, yeah I mean, this that, has a lot. This has a lot of sway. That was one of my questions. Actually, was whether yeah. Consumer Reports carries the same weight that it used to. Um, I know, you know, growing up, it was the de facto standard. If Consumer Reports said something was bad, you didn't touch that sucker. Right. Uh, but I don't know. You know, things are a lot different now. You get we get our information from a lot of different places. Uh, people on you, you know, many people probably trust. Uh, tests that they see of, of just average people on YouTube that are just known for doing that, as opposed to yeah, but, like a group like Consumer Reports. But I don't think I don't think it's I don't think that group is of the critical mass. Sure. I, I think I think that like like us being early adopters, there's a, there's a group that are very similar to us, which will depend on regular people on YouTube or other websites or things like that. But I think that there are literally millions of people who read Consumer Reports at their local library and believe that yeah. before they even go to pun tech pundits and things like that. So I think Consumer Reports has a very I, I I would be very surprised if Apple dismisses this because I think Consumer Reports has a, a lot yeah. of influence with the general public. Public. Yeah, you have no. to imagine Apple's going to get this. They're not happy about receiving this, I have to imagine. And hopefully they can get in there and maybe do something to, I don't know what you can do on the software side or or whatever the case may be, talk, but apparently they need talk, to do something. Talk about it. I mean, Consumer Reports, you got to get a better Christmas card next year for Apple. You know, like, hey, Merry <laughs> Christmas, Apple. Downgrade. Right. You know, like, right. it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to break it to you, but you're not getting a present from us this year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're getting coal, in fact. <laughs> Effective December 20th, those visiting the U.S. Uh, have begun to notice a new section of the Electronic System for Travel Authorization Form that asks for a person's online presence information. The optional section includes a drop-down menu to select from a number of services, services like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, GitHub's on there, uh, just to name a few. Of course, right, rights groups are complaining that this is a privacy violation. Um, I I mean, I have to like come at come at this with the devil's advocate is which is just the fact that this is public information and it's optional. So I don't know. What do you think? Is this an overstepping or do you think this is uh, there's sufficient reason to ask for this sort of thing? I don't think it's I don't, I don't think it's a privacy violation purely in, as you said, that it's optional. Like, mm -hmm. so if you don't want to give it to them, don't, you know, if it was required that would be a bigger problem if they were using some sort of nefarious method to find out this stuff. But it's like, hey, what's your Twitter? Tell us if you want to. If you have nothing to hide, then there's no – I have no reason not to share my Twitter account. Right. You know, um, which then begs the question, if someone who does have something to hide, what they're saying on Twitter, would they would they tell you know the, the government this? Right. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's public information. You can search somebody and find this stuff. So this is just a way to make it that much easier. Now, that said, if there's somebody who gets flagged – for some sort of reason, and this information is in the system, and then they you know, the watch list is expanded to social media, that gets a little disconcerting. But again, 
it's public, uh, you know, assuming you don't have a private account. I mean, it definitely is a weird gray area, but I'm fine with this being an optional kind of thing. I find it interesting that they're asking for GitHub, though. That's really interesting. Well, because they're looking for cy- they're looking for cyber attacks. Yeah. That, I mean, so yeah, so uh, yeah. Th- but I-, I was surprised to see this. But I- as of right now, it doesn't throw that many red flags. And if this is what it takes to protect us, then that's fine. Yeah, I mean, the optional flag ob- obviously makes it a little bit less of an eyebrow raiser, I suppose. But at the same time. Uh, is it this sort of thing where, yeah, it's optional, but if you choose not to provide it, then we're going to scrutinize you even more because what are you hiding? Why aren't you giving me your Twitter account? Well, uh, so yeah, it's, but but I mean, do they scrutinize you if you don't give your a phone number or like quite often, like when I go to other countries, they say, you know, where are you staying? Often I don't put that in or I don't put real information in there because I don't want them to know where I'm staying. Yeah, you know, like that's, right. you know, that's so um, and that's never gotten me in trouble. Um, but I also have nothing to hide and I'm not posting anything on Twitter that's incendiary. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm more worried about once you give it to them, then forever they know that's your account and then they keep an eye on it and if god forbid there's any sort of you know carnivore type application that can see private accounts that gets a little dicey but we don't know about that so well and there i mean there have been public stories throughout the year of services that are set up more from like an ad tech perspective that you know pull in all of this public information but are able to you know that that have accounts have deals with law enforcement with, you know, surveillance, um, programs to, in order to take all of this public information and combine it to create something actually very powerful and very insightful that, you know, sure, we're putting a lot of information out into the public. And when we do that, we choose for it to be public, but that plus that plus that plus that can paint a certain picture that it in and of itself doesn't paint. And then, and while, and Jason, you know me, I, I loathe politics and I don't like talking politics or whatever, but all of that equation that you laid out magnified by what 2017 will bring and beyond potentially might yeah. be a little, might be a little disconcerting for it sure. Might be so maybe, but, but is, that said, yeah. that said, I, I firmly believe that folks like the EFF and the ACLU are looking out for us. And if they, if it crosses a line, you know, those watchdog groups will, will be right there. So yeah. hopefully. Cross my fingers. At least I'm crossing my donated money fingers. So, yes. Yeah. Very good. A Virgin American flight on Tuesday was nearly diverted while in the air when a flight attendant spotted a Wi Fi hotspot on board named Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Note 7s, of course, are not allowed on board commercial airlines due to their poor record of explosive batteries and the resulting recall from Samsung. Uh, After multiple attempts to influence whoever the owner was to surrender the phone to avoid an alternate landing at 3 a.m., no less, someone finally stepped forward, revealing that they did not, in fact, own a Note 7. Uh, It's just that the SSID on the device on their uh, on their Wi-Fi spot hotspot was named Node seven. What are your thoughts on this? I, I, I laughed. <laughs> I, I feel bad. I laughed. I mean, you know that this is the sarcastic person who uses their phone as a hotspot, you know, in a coffee shop and and put on put this up to you know to you know be funny. Um, it, it would have sucked if they got diverted and had yeah. to land at Mercy Landing at 3 a.m. I'm glad they stepped forward. Um, why they had their hotspot on on the plane? Like supposed to be in airplane mode, people. You know, supposed to have your hotspot on. Um, but I think this is a whole lot of this is, you know, I mean, this is just this again. We we talk about this on all about Android. This is continuing the stigma of the Samsung Note 7 debacle. Yeah. Uh, and that now if you even have Samsung Note 7 anywhere, especially on planes, people are going to freak out. So this is this is just an example of that. Um, yeah. Now, one of the reasons so it very well could not be that someone just thought this was funny to have their hotspot named Note 7. Um, yeah. I've heard I've read and heard multiple accounts of people who have got in had their data moved from the note 7 to a different phone let's say the galaxy s7 in a device swap as they were doing at carriers and in that in that process th- certain settings are moved over so if that ssid on the note 7 was named such then yeah. it would appear on the new phone as that uh so it's, it's possible like we don't actually know whether this was yeah. like purposeful or not in that regard but uh there is there is at least a little bit of possibility of that how have we not found this person yet? Where, where, where's yeah, Nextable really when you question. need it? You know, yeah, like where, where, where's BuzzFeed when you need it, right? Like, <laughs> not, not everybody wants to go public, especially when it's something like this. Uh, you know, so I just really hope that this doesn't catch on because that's a that's kind of a sneaky and lame way to disrupt yeah. flights. You know, and easy nonetheless. Just rename the thing and open it up, and you're done.
Uh, whether Super Mario Run was actually a hit or not, but 50 million downloads in the first week seems to make me think that, yeah, it was. Uh, one thing appears certain, Nintendo is going to continue making games for mobile devices. Nintendo president Tatsumi uh, Kimishima said in an interview that the company plans to release going forward two to three new games every year. That's starting in 2017. We already actually know of a couple of the titles in 2017, Fire Emblem and then Animal Crossing. Those are kind of slated. Super Mario Run, I think, came out of the gate uh, strongly and uh, has done a really good job, even though some people are very critical of, of how they're making money on it and uh, some gameplay mechanics and everything. But I don't know. Uh, good, good move for Nintendo to, to kind of commit itself more to mobile. It's a no brainer. It's a yeah. no brainer. I, why it took this long is is baffling. But like, how many millions of handsets are around the world, especially in Japan and Korea, um, as well as the United States, that you that they're not monetizing? So I mean, this is this is going to do wonders for Nintendo's stock price next year, guaranteed. Um, you know, whether or not you agree with how the monetizing is working on Super Mario Run, they got to make money somehow, and so they're doing it. Um, I know a lot of people love Animal Crossing, and I can imagine them getting that much more addicted to it via their phones mm -hmm. uh you know so i think it's a no-brainer i just you know you know me i hate the fact that it launched on ios first and not simultaneously <laughs> or on android but right what are you gonna do yeah well they do say that they have plans to release on android so there's that um no word on whether these upcoming releases will get a simultaneous release whether it'll be on both or just ios at the beginning is this a trend is this how nintendo rolls out their games for mobile going forward i certainly hope not yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, I I I'll roll them out at the same time, you know, and and let everybody partake, you know, and and expand the user base. Yeah, you know, that's that's what's make key. that much more of an impact because I mean, when you do this, and you know, like there's even some folks in the chat room. Neo says I downloaded Super Mario Run, played ten seconds of it, then went meh and continued on with my life. And the risk that you take when you come out with such a high demand high profile game as, as in the Super Mario franchise, but release it on one platform is that when it finally comes to the other platform, you have a diminished potential fan base uh, yep. of, of people who would pay for it because by that point, they've already heard so much about it. And man, a lot of disappointment. It's like, well, why, why would I? Right. Yeah. So uh, open it up further by uh, releasing on both and then we'll be happy. Facebook apparently isn't the only social network overcharging for its ads based on inaccurate metrics. Twitter has reportedly overcharged video ad buyers up to 35% from November 7th to December 12th. Twitter reached out to the affected advertisers with the news this week, as well as issued refunds to them. Uh, Twitter says it was a technical error that resulted from an update to its Android client. Uh, you know, at least they acted quickly or seemingly it, it seems like they acted quickly, uh, but they didn't really make it public in any way until the story began to leak. This was really kind of a leak based on the emails that the advertisers were receiving, uh, whereas in the case of Facebook, they really made this a public thing, yet continually are coming out with more and more ways in which they realized they were doing things wrong on the back end. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't uh, ding Twitter for not coming out with this publicly because it's not, it's none of the public's business. This is yeah. really inside baseball stuff, you know. And it, and you know, it sucks that some advertisers were overcharged. It's great that Twitter identified it and are are uh, providing make goods or refunds or whatever they need to do. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a bummer that it happened, but this is the best way they can deal with it. But I don't think these companies, I don't, I think Facebook overdoes it in those situations to avoid any sort of criticism by yeah. going that that super public with it. I do think it's funny how in, you know, in the cases with Facebook and then now with Twitter, you never see it happen in the opposite direction. Like it's always, ah, we, uh, you know, we took too much of your money here. Let's, let's figure this out and give you money back. It's never in the opposite direction. Well, they never, nobody ever wants to hear, we didn't charge you enough. We're going to need to charge you more. Advertisers don't want to hear that's, a, that's how you lose advertisers. Yes. So yeah, I mean, but if, if anything, it just shows the fragility and the lack of maturity with a lot of these ad products that are being rolled out by Twitter and Facebook. Uh, you know, they're, they're being rolled out fast. They're coming up with new ways to monetize and errors are going to happen and number crunching is tough. I mean, I've worked, you know, Jason, you and I have worked in content and, and you know, we got a lot of advertisers and 
when I was at Revision 3, one of the biggest challenges was making sure we were telling our advertisers the right download numbers. You know, yeah. it's, it's hard. This is complicated stuff. And so I can't imagine the scale that Twitter and Facebook are dealing on, although Twitter is oh, a much sure. smaller scale than Facebook. So. Yeah, comparatively, yeah. absolutely yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, coming up, Ron and I are going to play a little game of tech hot or not. I don't know if that's the right name for it, but basically we're going to take a look at some tech trends and see if we think these have what it takes to last for the next however many years or if they're going to fizzle out and die. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They are the sponsor of this episode. Uh, Rocket Mortgage is perfect if you're the kind of person that well, you want the home or you want to refinance your home, but you don't want to go through all of the trouble of finding all the information that you need, digging up all that information uh, in order to put go through, go through the process, basically, because it's not easy. It's not easy finding all the information that you need in order to satisfy those requirements. And Rocket Mortgage is here to help. They're going to make it super easy for you. It brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. It's fast powerful, and completely online. Rocket Mortgage has taken all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for mortgage out of the equation. So if you, like me, hate searching through old stacks of paperwork and files and filing cabinets and all that kind of stuff to find exactly what you need, it's so inconvenient. Well, with Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs at the touch of a button. And that's going to help you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your unique financial situation. And even better with Rocket Mortgage, you can do all of this with that little phone that you already have or that tablet that you have at home. Uh, it's a quick online process that you can manage from the convenience of your couch or really anywhere you are because you've always got your phone on you, right? So if you're looking to refinance your mortgage or buy a home, check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. You'll want to go to quickenloans.com dot com slash tnt equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states and mls consumer access dot org number 3030 and we thank rocket mortgage by quicken loans for their support so yes uh we're we're heading right into the holiday break news was light so instead of doing our, our standard like interview mid-show I don't know. I thought we'd kind of talk about some of the tech trends that we've seen, kind of more of the consumer facing tech trends. Obviously, there's things like autonomous vehicles and artificial <laughs> intelligence and whatever. We're going to talk a lot about that next week during the holiday episodes as we take a look back and forward uh, as far as those tech trends are concerned. But I was kind of thinking more like consumer technology. We see all of these things kind of popping up. And uh, I just thought of another one that I can add to the list. Uh, Do it. Uh, More the merrier. Okay, yes. And and <laughs> I don't know like if they have the power to last for a long time or if they're just flashing the pan like, oh, that's neat, but whatever. Okay, I love it. Let's I, right. I love hot or not, and I love technology, so let's do it. All Hit right. Me. So first things first, Ron Richards, what do you think? Mm. Virtual reality, augmented reality had a big, big year this year. It's not new technology, it's been around for a while, but this is the year that it really kind of opened its eyes a little bit more. Do you think uh, going in the next two, three years, do you think this is gonna be a hot topic? Hot. I give it. A, I give it a hundred percent hot. Um, I think that we're just seeing the 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 fuse be lit on VR and AR. And as more and more people get exposure, more and more people get some sort of VR in their homes. We saw the success of Pokemon Go with AR. Um, we're going to continue to see that kind of get pushed. Um, I think it just we're this is on the upswing uh, on both on both topics. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I've gotten really into and very excited about VR as we've as we've gone through the year. Maybe less so about mobile, but like I said on all that Android a few days ago, I think that's purely because my eyes have been spoiled and my experience has been spoiled by the the higher kind of the the higher higher cost systems. But um, I think for the in the gaming world, I don't know how you how you appeal to gamers any more than making it even more immersive for them to live inside uh, the experience that they're that they're in. I still say I still haven't seen the gaming kind of experience that I want to see, which is I've often talked about on, on our other show, um, it, which is like the movie Her. Yeah. Where it's it's the projector that encompasses the room, and as opposed to putting on a visor and going into a space, it makes your game your 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 environment the space, and that's more AR kind of, I guess. Um, I haven't really seen anybody really playing in with that, which I think yeah. you, with projector technology and things like that, you could do. We've seen a couple of little things. There've been a little, there've been a couple of things here and there, which has a projector, which like puts out to your living room, kind of makes the walls look different and stuff like that. Yeah. I think we're going to see neater stuff like that. Um, but I think, you know, what Facebook is putting everything behind Oculus um, yeah. and, and VR, I think they're going to, they're going to push that boulder up the hill a lot more next year. And then we just see how I think, I think the sunny PlayStation VR is going to be a huge, 
huge gateway drug for a lot of people too as well. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Uh, yep. P P PlayStation VR with the uh, Batman Arkham uh, yep. as kind of like the stepping stone, like that yeah. opens your that literally that opens your eyes to the possibilities and re it's really transformative. Wearables Absolutely. and fitness trackers. We talked about the kind of rocky year that wearables have had. However, fitness trackers still kind of a category that that, that has its diehards. What do you think? Not. Not. Not cold. It's, it's, it's a, this is this is cooling off. We're seeing yeah. we're seeing the normalization of wearables. Um, I think I, I don't think wearables are going to go away. I think Apple will continue to have a watch. I think Android Wear will continue to plug along. But it is no way taking over the world like we thought it would be like two or three years ago. Um, I think the demise of Pebble is is kind right. of a big a big hit to the in innovation in the space um and you're going to see consolidation and normalization amongst wearables where it's just another thing it's just another thing that you can buy at best buy i mean it's already kind of gotten there too right like yep. the uh, google's news a couple of days ago that they're going to be releasing a couple of uh, android wear devices with oem uh, support next year and so many of the articles were like Really? They're really that's what they're spending their time on. And people are already rolling their eyes hard at the idea of like new wearables in the space. It's yep. kind of that train is already left to a certain degree. So yep. uh, but I do I do I do think wearables will continue to progress in the in the normal space. I mean, like we talked about on all about Android, the fossil Q has been heavily advertised in major metropolitan cities as just a fossil watch that has Android wear on it, you know, like mm -hmm. not as a smart, you know, like, so I think it's going to still kick around, but it's not going to change our lives. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I completely yeah. agree. Touchscreen PCs. I mean, we saw, I, I don't know if you've had the chance to like get your hands on or, or see up close and personal, the surface studio or the new surface, uh, computers, but I mean, it's really for, for, uh, for creatives, really compelling. What did you think? Yep. Um, I, I'll give this one a warm, um, you know, not quite hot, but not quite not. I think this is not or not hot. Not, no, a warm. It's a, <laughs> it's a warm feeling. Okay. I do think I really like the Surface Studio. I haven't got a chance to play with it yet. I actually, um, over the break, I'm planning on going to one of those Microsoft stores. I want to see if they have it there. Um, but I, 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 I love the the dial, the the kind of thing that can go over the screen and and to allow for for precision settings and and color values and things like that. I think Microsoft is doing some very very interesting thing with the Surface Studio, and I'll be curious to see if other manufacturers pick up and follow. The, if it if this is if is what Microsoft doing an aberration or a trend. Right. And I think next year we'll find out and then it might become hot. But right now it's just kind of keep an eye on it. But we're definitely moving into a touch society. I mean, we've got a generation of kids who who I just heard a story last night that uh, public education is having an issue with elementary school kids that don't know how to use uh, a mouse mm -hmm. because they're so used to that. phones yeah. and tablets. Right. You know, and that, that they, they actually need to do education with kids on how to use a mouse and how to click in order to take tests. Um, so I think we're moving towards a touch, a touch society. It just what form does it takes? And yeah, there's the little dial thing on the Microsoft thing. That's so cool. So, anyway. yeah, I mean, what, what you're saying is what I feel like I was, I was predicting and obviously very er too early to the game a couple of years yeah. ago where I was just like, you know, kids are growing up with these touch screens. Like the paradigm is going to be touch and everything else is going to be dated. Yep. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, that's crazy talk. And I think maybe then it was, but now they're starting I mean, just more and more that is the case. And so these crossover converging kind of technologies are going to help with that. Um, I I would love to see this this trend continue because I think there's a lot of potential there. And I actually like having a touchscreen. I have one on the, the Google Pixel uh, that I have right here. So, Very cool. Uh, okay, so then kind of related touch bars. MacBook Pros didn't quite go full touchscreen. They went touch bar. Is this something people really care about for the next couple of years? Well, if, uh, well, I can't speak for the general public, but for me, this is as hot as it gets. I love that really? dang touch bar. I love it. I really? love it. Okay. Uh, did you see the guy who programmed Lemmings to go across it? No, I've do seen Pac-Man, but I haven't seen Lemmings. Yeah. But that the guy did. Perfect. The guy did Lemmings. It's out there. Um, but I don't know. I, I for I remember, geez, ten years ago. Uh, talking with Kevin Rose and 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 stuff about OLED and and the the future of it and OLED keyboards and all this sort of stuff and I feel like we've been waiting for this. I love the idea 
of a OLED keyboard that is customized to the application you're working on. And I think the touch bar is the first step in that direction. Yeah. And I think we're going to get to a point where the keyboards are completely, you're using Final Cut Pro or uh, Premiere and the keys completely change to what works for an editing suite. And, you know, I'm working in Audacity and that will completely change to what works in an audio suite. And I'm a writer and it will change to a writing keyboard. I think that's so cool. And the touchscreen is just the beginning of it. Uh, so I'm very excited. I, I did get to play with the MacBook uh, despite the battery life for consumer reports, but I did get to play with the new MacBook with a touch with the touch bar and it, it, it exceeded my expectations. I thought it was awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, you put it that way. I think I was hesitant to go hot on, on this until you d yeah. you described it because I do see a, a future where the keys are all kind of like that and they can yep. be, you know, programmed or changed uh, depending on the context. So if the touch bar is the uh, kind of way that you get there, then I'm all about it. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I've heard people when I, when I've talked about the the future of the keyboard and the interface object, um, you know, and, and people are like, well, then the whole bottom of the screen is just going to be another tablet screen, and what's the point? And I don't think it needs to be. I think you can still make a OLED keyboard that's got physical squares of keys and the, the what displayed on those keys changes like that's that's right. where I, i'm excited about seeing it going i don't necessarily want another screen just that that, that the you know that is going to become you know customizable because you still need that i still think you need that tactile reference of this is a key and this is where it is, exists in the beginning and the end of it yeah. um and i think if anybody can figure this out apple will because they're they're clearly starting that innovate in, innovation so uh, I think I know the answer to this one already. Uh, IOT, Internet of Things. What do you think? Hot. Just, just getting, just the fire getting started. I love it. It's, I think, fire's I think burning. Every time you talk to your Google home, that fire's burning. I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, I mean, I used it at a party last night yeah. in my apartment and, and watching people for the first time interact with it and be delighted. It's that yeah. the thing about good technology is good technology delights. It's almost like a Disney esque to it where, it, it's magical. It makes a Christmas wreath out of lights. It answers the question with a funny answer. It gives you the information you're looking for very easily. Um, and I think that, you know, we're now on, I mean, a year plus of the Amazon Echo, which just continues to get, you know, that Amazon hockey puck, the tap is a great device. A friend of mine put one in every one of his uh, rooms in his apartment. Like it's a low cost. It's, mm -hmm. it's a great entry point. I think Google home is a great starting point. The Google assistant is going to be so powerful. Um, and these are the things that are, I keep talking about normalization. And I think that's what next year is going to be because Google home and Amazon Alexa or Amazon Echo is going to help normalize the idea of smart devices and bring the rest of the people, you know, the general public to this idea of all your devices are talking and that's how you interact with them. Um, and I think it's super excited. I love it. I love what's being done with home automation and with with every little device, whether it's a Nest thermostat or uh, Samsung smart things with smart outlets and all that sort of stuff. I think it's so cool. And and it, it becomes like a real life Lego set. You know, yeah, it really does. That's, yeah. that's a really great way to put it because yeah. what once you have the infrastructure to support like a, a nice hub or whatever. And then you realize yeah. all these little things, they're like $35, they're $40. They're not like break the bank expensive. And so you can add all these little conveniences to your life for not very much money. And slowly over time, you build great capability into your home. So I think I agree. IOT, I think is going to continue to be a big deal. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I think, I think I know this one too. 3d printing. We may, we nah. may, the dawn is, the sun is set on 3d printing at this point, or at least close to, right? I don't know if the sun is set. I feel as I if, we, I don't mean it's going away forever. I just yeah, mean like no, it's had I, its prime time. I feel, I feel like the, the, you, the, va the vanity, but the uniqueness of a uh, 3d printer has the, has the shine is worn off, yeah. but for the maker community, it, it's it's vital now, you know. Yeah. Like I mean, they, they, I've seen it. I've seen it alone in you know, as as anybody who follows me or knows me knows, I'm an avid pinball player. There are pinball manufacturers who are making stuff for new pinball machines with 3D printers, like making little you know, kind of uh, toys and things like that that go on the on the play field with 3D printers. You know, like wow. 3D printers are enabling a level of creativity and production that we've never had before. But not every not every home needs one yet. And and yeah. I think there might be a day where that happens, but the printers have to improve to the point where you don't have to let it sit for 36 hours. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and finally, this is the one that I added in, bezel-less yeah. screens. We've seen a little ah. bit of this this year. We, there's ah. rumors that Apple's getting on this train. What do you think? <laughs> I, I mean, I think you and I differ on this, but I think I, I, bezel-less screens are the future, man. They're totally the future. Really? 
I mean, yeah. I think they're cool. Like, I know you like them because of the sci-fi aspect. Like, yes. This is, this is what sci-fi portends. Yep. And, that, and that's and that's ultimately where I want to see technology go is towards that Star Trek science fiction future. Yeah. And I think that a bezel-less, a bezel-less screen, uh, it's it's a and we need to see the glass and the the interfaces evolve along with it. But I really think bezel-less is the way to go. And we're going to look back at phones with bezels and be like, look how silly they look. So as long as there isn't a fragility that comes along with them, because I'm just not willing to like make my phone even more fragile, like like glass on the front and back. Was seemed yep. like a great idea, and sure, it made a phone look really great. Until that one time, you set it down just slightly too hard on that on that hard tabletop, or worse, and then you realize, okay, yeah, but this is really fragile. I don't, it looks cool, but I just don't know. Listen, all I know is that in Star Trek Four, Scotty talked about transparent aluminum. All right, and once we once we crack that formula for transparent aluminum, I think we'll be that step closer to a phone that doesn't fall apart. So, so. what you're saying is that's all we have to do. All yeah. we have to oh. do is what you just said. Okay. Exactly. All right. Great. I love it. I love that segment. We should definitely check in on that again next year and see how we did. Uh, <laughs> feedback time. <laughs> Nick writes in to TNT at twit.tv uh, TV to say, on TNT 1665, a listener suggests that municipalities will have a hard time making up for the fines lost to self-driving cars. True, but how much will be saved when bylaw officers don't have to be meter maids, when police don't have to show up to court to defend tickets, and when there aren't accidents to clean up after? Hopefully those cost savings will make up at least the majority of the difference. What do you think as far as, uh, I mean, we were kind of talking a little bit wider, and then this was one part of the topic of, as far as AI, uh, automation, you know, all, all this stuff, eliminating jobs, and, and, you know, where does the money go? Where does the economy go when that happens? What do you think? I mean, th this this sort of disruption happens every time there's new technology. You know, yeah. like the you know people were people were afraid of cars because what would happen to the people who tended the horses? You know, like and and the horse, you know, the stagecoach carriers and all this sort of stuff. I mean, at every point, those people, uh, society adjusts. Those people who were previously employed in those things will have to learn a new job or the next person will learn that job differently. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to know is what mythical municipality Nick lives in where cops actually show up to court when you contest the ticket because <laughs> isn't, isn't that the secret way to get out of a ticket is because the cop never shows up. But, um, but yeah, no, I think – I mean every time we talk about the loss of jobs or changes in our society, it, I mean it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a micro – it's it's a micro complaint about a macro solution, mm. um, which is that, yes, that guy who's the meter maid or, or the cop or whatever it is might not be doing that role. But in the grand scheme of things, the universe adjusts and new roles pop up. Um, so I don't I'm not that worried about it. I mean, I think driverless cars are the future. We're going to get there at some point. It's going to be like the Jetsons and, you know, it's going to be some bumps along the way. But uh, that's that's what progress is. The Jetsons. <laughs> wow, that was great. I had a lot of practice <laughs> as a kid. That's, TNT, uh, and that isn't even that isn't even good. I can do better than that, but I'm not. <laughs> TNT's fan of the day is Gary Marsh, who sent us this time lapse video, stepping it up here, saying, "I'm retired and live in the rainforest, Lake uh, Quinault. No TV, no cell reception, and two FM radio stations. Fortunately, I get good enough bandwidth to watch Twit podcasts. Here I am with my dogs, watching you on the first day of winter." Excellent. Thanks for sending it in. You've stepped up the game for everyone else. Now everyone needs to send in a time-lapse video. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we'll find it. And finally, proving that we can't even be trusted to pick out the food that we eat, Baidu, which is basically China's Google, uh, partnered with Kentucky Fried Chicken to open a smart restaurant in Beijing that will analyze data about you to help you pick something to eat. Facial recognition, gender, age, the expression on your face, all that gets mixed together in an artificial intelligence soup that then spits out suggestions in a hope, in the hopes uh, to effectively guess what you might pick, possibly influence it. Because I don't know. Uh, I don't know. What do you think about this? Uh, return guests are actually going to be re recognized and offered previous meals. I guess that's a, a, a bonus here, but I just feel like, why? Why? I love it. I Why love trade this. this information for something so meaningless? 
I, don't know. I love it. This is great. I want. I want. I well. I. I, I don't want it at fast food because fast food is going to kill you. But I love the idea of tracking the food you eat and then giving feedback. You know, like I. I tried the spicy chick. The spicy chicken. Whatever. And I didn't like it or I did like it. And then the next time them recognizing you and saying, hey, we got a new thing we think you might like based off your previous uh, um, purchases. I think that's great. I think I smart technology being applied to these sort of things are just fantastic. The random, you know, we're going to take a picture of your facial expression and your age and guess what you might like. That's a little sketchy. <laughs> but I, I think the, the repeat customer aspect of it and building a database around your food preferences uh, has a ton of potential. And food tech is, hu- is going to be huge in the upcoming years. And I like seeing much like even though I don't like Domino's Pizza, I love that Domino's Pizza innovates. And to yeah, see, yeah, yeah, and to see Kentucky Fried Chicken and Baidu innovating in this space is really cool. So, when you go to restaurants, do you often get the same thing every time? You see, that's a problem. That's a problem because uh, sometimes I do, and sometimes you want to try something different, but you don't want to take the risk. So, if you have machine learning behind it yeah. to say, "Listen, we know what your preferences are. You don't like spicy food, or you don't like seafood, or whatever. Try this," and it's a smart suggestion of uh, of ordering. Yeah. I think that's great. Yeah. So. You're going to like the cheeseburger here. I promise. (laughs) Uh, Ron, always a pleasure getting to podcast with you, man. Thank you so much for hopping on today and talking with uh, what little tech news there was today to talk about. Well, we made this it. is a this is officially my last podcast of Woo-hoo! 2016. I, I'm so happy to, to be here. I'm very excited for the holidays, <laughs> but I, I, I it's been a heavy podcasting year for me, and I can't yeah. think of a better way to go out than with you, Jason. Awesome, so. man. Uh, yeah. where, where do you want people to kind of follow what you're doing? You got a lot of stuff going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Real quick, uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm twitter.com/slash Ronxo. Uh, I've got. Uh, I've got a, a bunch of shows uh, at, previously mentioned on the Twit Network. You and I and Florence Ion every Tuesday are doing all about Android at 5.30 Pacific time uh, as well as, on Tuesdays as well as you can download that as wherever place you download it. So if you like Android, that's what you got to listen to. Um, I also do, if you dig comic books, check out ifanboy.com. Every week we're talking about uh, the latest and greatest in comics. And in fact, if you're interested in movies and TV and stuff like that, we put out our all media wrap up, which has already gotten the most download, the most yeah. downloaded show we've ever done. Um, it, yeah, it's doing really, really well. And we also just put out our Rogue One review. So if you want to hear what we think about Rogue One, it's there. And then finally, this pa- uh, the past November, I launched a new podcast with Tom Merritt uh, called A Damn Fine Podcast. And you can go to a damn fine, you can go to damnfinepodcast.com. If you like Twin Peaks, you're going to want to listen to the show. We're reanalyzing every episode of Twin Peaks as we lead up to the new season that's coming later in 2017. So, uh, and it's always fun to do stuff with Tom Merritt. So I'm, I'm excited about that one. So awesome check stuff. them all out. You mentioned yeah. Rogue One, so I'll ask you f- my final question. Rogue One, hot or not? Hot. Okay, because I got to see I, it. I give it a thumbs up. Uh, see, I, I don't want to spoil it. If you haven't yeah, seen don't it, spoil it. Don't, don't spoil it. it. Yeah. Hot's good I, enough for me. Hot hot with an asterisk after you see it. We'll talk about that asterisk. Okay. All right. That works for me. All right. Yeah. Thanks again, Ron. Happy Thank holidays. You, Happy holidays. Uh, There will be no live shows all next week, but Megan and I have produced five brand new episodes that will publish throughout the week. We talk about some with some familiar voices, people that have been on the show all throughout the year about some of the year's biggest themes, AI, social media, car tech, security, privacy, and gaming. Check for that starting on Monday. Same I mean, if you're subscribed to the feed, nothing changes. You'll get new episodes. That's all I'm saying. In the meantime, you can find this show on Twitter, we are at Tech News Today TV. Uh, you don't need to email us right now because we won't read them until we get back in the new year. So there you go. Find all the way to, ways to subscribe to the show at our uh, our page on the web. It's twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole, for helping out all year long. Uh, thanks to Alex Gumpel for helping out here in the studio, scrolling words on the screen and saying, yeah. Uh, thanks to Kevin for editing always. Really appreciate it. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. Uh, we'll see you on Monday in a pre-recorded episode. Have a great holiday. Bye, everybody. Yeah.